So, shall we start? Hello, everybody. So, you may remember us from previous sessions, such as the Ignoring Negativity buff that we ran, or a panel session, rather, we ran on Monday. Um, you may also remember us for the Ignore Negativity buff that was messed up in the schedule and didn't run. And didn't run yesterday. Apologies for that. It wasn't deliberate. We screwed up. Um, so one of the bits of feedback that, we, that I think we've all had from people since we ran that panel session on Monday was that um, there was a lot more f discussion and whatever and feedback and you know, more points that people would have liked to have raised. But we were, we were horrible people and we totally ran out of time. So if this session is basically for that, we're not going to be driving much. We're happy to take questions. We're happily, of course, we're all happy to riff on this for hours and hours and days and days. But let's hear what the rest of you have to say. So let's start. Who has a question? Who has a point? Stunned silence. Perhaps recap what we said in the panel. Go for it. I'm the one who doesn't remember. <laughs> I talked. I didn't listen. <laughs> oh. So we went through a lot of points about how we cope and how we suggest other people might cope with negativity. This is not about ignoring trolling. This is not about ignoring harassment. It's how to deal with the day-to-day -day potential demotivational things that you might see in Debian and in other places in free software, but how to get on with that and how to still be productive day-to-day, -day, how to get on and have fun. You know, don't let it get you down. Um, we had a whole range of things. I'm hoping most of the people here were in the session. We don't want to recap it completely. <laughs> Exactly, because that would take the whole hour and that defeats the point. If, if you just want to hear us again, we were recorded by our wonderful video team and, and I believe it's already up on the net. My wife has watched it and told me um, apparently we were great. But, she, she's, but she's biased. <laughs> say something provocative. Say something, I'd say something provocative. Go on. Um, so when you're doing Debian things, uh, you get people trying to get things done and people trying to troll the lists. And of course, you tend to pay more attention to the people that try to troll the lists. Uh, where, but what you really wanted to do is to get something done. So what's wrong with you? Why are you choosing to use your energy that way? Why are you giving it to people that ask you for the whole wrongest of reasons? Is that provocative enough? I don't know what do people think. Ian, please come and grab a mic. So the, the obvious reason, of course, is somebody is wrong on the internet. Um, but, you know, that, that's not a really good reason and we can maybe try to be better about that. But there are also things that are arguably good reasons, or at least um, reasons why it is difficult to ignore, you know, that make it harder to ignore. Uh, for example, um, if you allow somebody to post some outrageous opinion and then don't challenge it, or maybe only one person challenges it, then you can get a very skewed, you know, reading the list gives you a very skewed view of what the general opinion is in the project. And we, we have had numerous occasions in the past where it has been become clear sometimes far, far too late that the distribution of opinion in the project is badly represented by uh, mailing list traffic and um, it would be nicer if we could deal with that sooner. Um, also, if somebody's behavior is kind of crossing a line, then it can be useful to correct them in public. Um, depend I mean, sometimes it can be better to cross them in private as well, of course, but. Really? I have to stand up? Oh, God. It's getting late in the day. Um, 
So I think you're absolutely right, Ian. One of the things that gets really frustrating in Debian sometimes is when we get into a lengthy argument about something on a list and somebody coming in later can't really get any sense of what the project overall thinks. I talked about this the other day as sort of the tyranny of the vocal minority, the fact that the people that are willing to spend time um, putting lots of text into a discussion often end up having a disproportionately large percentage of the perceived effect in that conversation. And I don't really know what the fix is, except that I've learned over time that I'm much more productive when I sort of skim that stuff, go, yeah, okay, there's another one of those going on, and then just go back to work. Um, and I don't know how we balance this. Um, it's absolutely true that when somebody's being downright wrong about something, that keeping that from going on forever would be a great thing. And I'd love for the rest of the world to have some way to sort of understand, you know, what the majority of folks in Debian actually think and believe and are actually <coughs> sort of focused on. But I don't really know how to fix that. Um, so personally, the way I handle this is I put a lot less energy into keeping on top of all the things that are happening on all the lists every day than I once did. And that seems to be a, a pretty useful productivity tool. Um, but I don't know, you know, I worry a little bit that if those of us who care the most sort of spend less time paying attention to all of these sorts of discussions that are going on, that you know, that doesn't necessarily bode well for the long term either. Um. Uh, no, no. Uh, may I? Uh, yeah, I, I, I unfortunately have a mic on myself, so it's hard for me to, to, to use the token for to, so beat me with the mic if I'm speaking when I shouldn't. Um, representation is an interesting keyword there for me um, because it's not about reaching a consensus anymore when we're talking about representation. It's about showing that maybe there isn't a consensus. So maybe in that case, a lot of energy can be saved in replying, I disagree, uh, without trying to convince the other person that they're wrong. Because that hardly ever works, uh, depending on the people. Ooh, but yeah, when a people is getting heated, uh, trying to convince them that they're wrong is like, Worse, but you know, uh, I, I and somehow Russell comes to mind as somebody who would say I disagree on this for this reason, mm. but doesn't add, and you are wrong for that reason. Sure. So there's a lot to be said for a good, clear discussion of the points and making it clear that we, you respect somebody's opinion, but you don't agree with them. Um, just saying, of course, you disagree is never going to convince anybody else who is watching a discussion because, of course, they don't understand your reasoning. But equally, it take, doesn't take very much time. There's arguments. I mean, I've hit, we, I think we, we, hopefully we all remember, I've heard suggestions of um, limiting the number of mails a person can send to, say, Debbie and Devel in a day, a week, a month, to try and cut down on the overwhelming volume problem but again, it's the technical solution to a social problem, and I'm not going to fall into the trap of saying that can never work, but it's really hard. Yeah, I'm wondering, still representation-wise, if I say, if I answer to someone, I disagree, I think that this, mm. and then I drop the thread. Yeah. Um, if they will try to say I'm wrong in so many ways, I don't care, I've expressed my disagreement. Sure. Representation-wise, there's been a voice. Definitely, that thing. I think that is good. There's, we do have a lot of, and I can fall, fall foul of this, and I know other people can as well, of wanting to follow up to everything in a thread that you disagree with. But of course, once you start then multiplying up by a thousand or ten thousand people, that's clearly never going to work. And really, honestly, if you're somebody who has useful work to do, it's mm -hmm. giving somebody else an immense amount of power by allowing them to steal your productivity, which you know, at the end of the day, doesn't make anything better. Um, cool. Other thoughts, suggestions, whatever? I mean, there's a mic there. Um, well, Chris also wanted. But oh, Chris, sorry. Well, just a very quick follow-up to that. What about, um, 
stand this side. What about um, replying saying, why don't we just bring this thread to a this 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 thread to a con sorry? How about we just bring this thread to a you know an abrupt conclusion? Just like yeah, I think everything's been said here. Let's just close up and move on. Like, I mean, I've tried a couple of times. Yeah, sorry, guys. I've tried a couple of times, but it hasn't really worked. Um, so yeah. Sounds like a cool idea. I know it's not it's not something that you tend to see. I'm curious to see how well it might work, of course, when people are in full angry rant flow, they might just ignore you. But it could be a way of trying to help signal to others that you think it you know, that you think we've had all the useful discussion. Yeah. And it's something that DPL probably has a specific weight that makes it work more than other people in the project. So, of course, so we'll get to you in a moment, Dan. Um, of course, we have had, as we already, we already mentioned on Monday, the suggestion of hang fire. If more people could be convinced to make their point, wait to see what other people have to say properly, read everything and consider, and then respond once, I think we might end up with less of a flooding problem. <laughs> we can hope. Oh, but if... I will respond once, then they'll be expecting I'm now part of the discussion, so if I, then I, I just want to respond once, but they'll be waiting for me to respond over and over, so I don't want to get started responding at all. Sure. It, it depends on, if you're having a, a discussion backwards and forwards, potentially that might be worth wandering off and away from a public list. It, you know, what we're, what we're talking about more is the ever-increasing, you know, disagreement, even anger, that can end up coming out of a, of, a, of, a, of a long flame fest. You know, if we can start cutting down on those before we get to that point, that's, that's I think, where we can benefit. And maybe there's a distinction between part contributing to a discussion and trying to win the argument. Yeah, I mean, if we have a really long thread because there are lots of good things that are being discussed and we're moving towards some sort of a technical consensus, that's awesome. It's when all of a sudden there's, you know, somebody replies and says, well, I don't think so, and you're, you're missing the point on the following six things, and then all of a sudden there are sort of 12 points made and you reply to that, and the next thing you know, and the next thing you know, you just get this long thread of people bickering back and forth with, really huge emails, it doesn't really make anything better at the end of the day. And you know, if one of the things that comes out of this is that there's now sort of a recorded record of several of us saying, please just don't do that on our mailing list, I don't know if it will cause anything to get better on the lists or not, but at least it's something we can point to when this starts to happen and say, do you really think this is making the world a better place? And uh, try and push back on its own. I have a, a question, which is that because I'm, I'm sometimes on the other end of, I'm kind of, some of my hats are hats which tend to say no, uh, both my technical committee, but also my DSA hat. Um, are there changes in our approach and our procedures that we should do and take to, to make it so that we don't actually end up stealing, like, we don't want to say no just to say no, but um, as anybody who has been kind of involved in, in uh, especially for the technical committee, been involved in the entire process, it can be draining. We've seen people just uh, give up their packages because they don't want to, like they feel basically they're, they're in front of a tribunal, which is very public. Is there something we can do that while still not necessarily like moving to a private process, or, but like how can we how can we fix these these problems? That's a really good question. I don't have a snappy answer. <laughs> I'd like to try to address it. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> I think it's an example of when technical non technical is not the scale that we should be talking about because there are technicalities of how to address arguments. There are people with expertise in facilitating discussion. There are many, many approaches and processes for arguing together and online, you know, is a different 
medium than others, but there are still different ways. So, for example, I often see people arguing with very, very long threads with a lot of very impassioned feelings, and then someone tries to say stop, but the thing, but the people are not arguing the same question. So they don't feel heard, the, I, the issue hasn't been addressed, uh, and sometimes just being able to parse out what are the issues here. So I think when, to be helpful in a situation like that, it's sometimes helpful to just step back, read over it and say, I like the word concerns. How many concerns are being addressed here? Who is addressing which concern? Are they misunderstanding what the real concern was? Did it actually hurt the person to say that rather than help? Because the, the concern was misunderstood? Yeah. So sometimes just asking questions, what are the concerns we're trying to address here can be helpful. Um, that reminds me of me dealing with ESA a few times, which maybe I went to the list and saying, hey, can you change that configuration that way or restore that thing? And the answer was no. Why would you do that? And then I would be taking a step back and realize that I went there with a strategy instead of with a need. And so I'm like, um, actually, yeah, what I needed was to be able to do that thing because I'm trying to get that job done. And then somebody from DSA comes back saying, they why don't you do it that way? It's easier for us to deal with. And I'm like, yeah, OK, that makes sense. And ooh, um, so the, 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 the DSA wise, it's a thing because it, with DSA, it has to be a negotiation. Everything that I ask is something that somebody else needs to maintain. So we need to come to an agreement there. With technical committee, I've had much less dealing with. So. Sure. So when it comes down to an argument that may, might get bounced to the technical committee, and I've seen a number of those over the years, um, there is a classic mediation strategy of trying to get each side, you know, the person on each side, to actually state what they think the other side is understanding. Um, if, you can for, if you can convince yourself to empathize and understand the other side, and even state what you think the other side's opinion is in a constructive manner, and of course, the constructive bit is not easy if you're already angry, and I've, I know we've all been there, but to actually to try and state what you think the good points are, are and the bad points maybe of the other side, you can then actually maybe start, it will help you to start empathizing. You can actually start to see where they're coming from. You can also, it then gives them a chance to say, you understand most of my position except you know, but actually then deal in the facts de rather than just raw opinions and anger. It's, it's a good way of I said, just promoting empathy. I've been through it consciously a few times when I've had disagreements in the workplace or whatever. It makes a huge difference, but it's, an, it's not an easy one to do. Um, yeah, the, um, the general term for that conflation of needs, wants, versus, and or... Um, uh, strategy versus, um, yeah, it's called a XY problem, and it's a very, it's a Googleable term for that kind of, that confusion there. So, yeah. yeah, I got it from nonviolent communication, but in a different name, but I guess it's the same idea. One thing that I'll just throw out in this context, particularly with respect to sort of this notion that maybe we need to change some processes. Um, there have been a couple of discussions recently that seem to be completely civilized and trying to drive towards some useful technical um, conclusion where somebody in our project didn't want to participate because some past history had caused them to be really irritated with one or more of the participants in a conversation or um, a body that they thought in the project wasn't um, actually making things better. And I think we have to be very careful um, not to fall into the trap of saying, gee, because something in the past didn't go well here before that nothing will ever go well here again. And that leads me to be you know, very concerned that, um, that we all sort of think about what we're saying and what we mean and, and sort of what the context is, when, particularly when somebody comes and says, hey, um, it would be really helpful to have your opinion on this particular thing. Uh, I have found myself being asked that sometimes in the past and having to say, you know, I haven't thought about that. I don't really have an answer. But if I ever felt like the right thing to say was, um, you don't deserve an answer, then that, that would just be 
you know, bad behavior, and we got to figure out how to not do that. Oh, well, even small size companies have a, a human relationships uh, officer or workshops and the whole official thing and the, and the, uh, uh, all these kind of things. So how could Debian not have an official facilitator of human communications or whatever? So I mean, you, you, know, you got your you know uh, college degrees and stuff. To, let's not just do this the amateur homebrew method. You got to use the professional methods. Here. Well, that's an interesting question. And of course, one of the things that's really, really different about Debian compared to a lot of other things is that we're not a company. And so while we do have access to some financial resources and then we have used them at times to put together sprint meetings and other places, sometimes with um, specific facilitation assistance when it seemed to the team in question like that would make things go better, on an average day, there is no HR department in Debian, really. There are roles in the project that take on some of the responsibilities that a company's HR department would take on. But um, I think we have to be really careful to not sort of screw up the things that are really unique and special and sort of encouraging to volunteer participation about Debian in the process of trying to be you know, more effective and avoid causing each other problems that aren't related to the work we're trying to do as we go forward. It's a good question, though. Um, in other venues that are about Debian, um, I've seen workshops being done to teach people how to take a no and how to say a no, uh, but how to take a no. And that's probably something which we could have some literature in Debian. Um, uh, because, yeah, mm, uh, that, that's not an HR thing. I'll get back to that. It's not an HR thing, it's a skill thing, and skills can be taught. So actually, in my company, we have employed an outside consultant, uh, actually a friend of mine, unrelated, uh, called the Geek Whisperer, whose job it is actually to go around and to help explain to people with specific examples to people's roles and to people's experiences, work through some of these problems, especially dealing with negativity you know, and working out, just helping people to gain those skills on how to interact well and just, just, you know, how to get on with each other. Even when you have the stressful decisions, when you have to make the, make, you know, say, your idea is bad or this idea is better, you know, and help people to get on with that without being destroyed by it. You know, lots of us are, can get very attached to our technical opinions. It takes a lot of practice and I, it's sometimes a lot of soul searching to understand that's not the right thing. It also just occurred to me that, that I'm, I'm probably not unique in the project in this way, but I certainly have been aware of the fact that I had the benefit of several decades of involvement in a company that cared a lot about these sorts of issues and spent a lot of time and energy sending employees off to classes to learn how to do lots of things better. And I've tried to share some of that at various times in various ways in the project. But I've also been very conscious sometimes that other people I'm interacting with haven't had the same experiences I have, don't have the same context, and it would be unfair of me to assume that they always thought about problems the same way. I don't know exactly what that means here, but for all of you that have a job somewhere that causes you to have to go take training classes about how to work better with other people and how to do, you know, build strong and effective teams and all that, you have to sort of pay attention and, and know that some things you learn there are really easy to bring and apply in an open source context or a project like Debian. And some of those things you have to be a little bit careful about because we're all here as volunteers, not because somebody's paying us. And that does lead to a different sort of relationship dynamic sometimes. You want to dive in something different? Uh, yeah. So here's a a common situation for a lot of us, uh, you maintain something and there's a decision to be taken that has impacts on others. So there's a mailing list thread or a bug about what should be done. And often what you kind of have two choices. You can either basically say, there's no consensus here or I can't determine a consensus. I'm going to do nothing. And, you end, and that's kind of like, making a decision by default, it's sometimes 
the right thing to do, but often it's not. Often it's better to do something. Uh, so your other choice is to try and decide which of the threads of conversation are relevant and which are the things we're talking about today. So which are just uh, negativity that really you should just decide are not relevant to your decision about what to implement. And I'm assuming here that you as a maintainer are not particularly involved in the discussion. Um, that's that's an, a factor that makes it harder, but often you're not. You just like, maybe you don't use this feature, but two groups do, and you've got to decide which one to put in the archive. Uh, how, do you, how do you decide which threads to pay attention to? <laughs> right? How do you avoid this decision by default of leaving a bug open for years and years because there's too much. I don't know. I leave bugs open for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer have any three-digit bugs numbers open against my package. I, <laughs> I don't think I have any four or five-digit bug numbers open anymore, but it hasn't been that long. OK, cool. Um, I, I've had some notable bugs in history, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm not sure there's a really simple answer to that. I am Part of the reason I was sitting here scratching my head a little bit is that it's been, in my experience, really rare that I felt like there was value in asking the question where I didn't have some inherent sentiment about what I thought a good answer would be. Um, if I was aware that there were multiple choices and I really wanted to find out if the way I was thinking about it was sort of a consensus opinion, that would be one kind of situation. And if it seemed to be coming to an impasse and nothing was happening, then I would at least have some personal sense of, yeah, okay, if, if there's no clear consensus here and I thought A was the right answer, then let's just go do A and let the chips fall. Um, and and, and <clears throat> at the other end of the spectrum, if you really don't have an opinion at all, and you thought a reasonable solution from the beginning was just don't do anything until things become clearer, then that may not be a horrible thing to do. Um, it, this, this is where you get into this tension where if somebody requested a change because there's something they want to do that's blocked by something that you need to do for them, and you look at it and you go, yeah, there's like you know different ways you could think about this and that might be a bad precedent or a bad path to go down or something. It just gets difficult and I think that's why we're all supposed to be intelligent people who are willing and able to put the time and energy in to think about things. And it's one of the things that I really like about the Debian structure and the constitution that you know Ian drafted for us so long ago is this notion that the majority of the responsibility is left in the hands of individual developers, and we're supposed to be able to figure almost everything out without having to go get somebody else to tell us what the answer is. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it easier when you do find yourself in one of those situations, and I'm confident that anybody in a role where they're trying to do policy documentation or something else like that where it may not be their own ax to grind, but you know which edge of the ax should be made sharp. Um, I'm sure that's difficult. I don't know that I have a whole lot of other advice about that. So having been in some of those discussions at various points over the years, um, I can't necessarily give you much advice to say definitely do this, do that. Um, I've tended to evaluate, say, if people are demanding, not asking demanding, asking for and trying to justify, say, major changes, um, try and judge how active they might be in helping if future help is needed. You know, more active people are good, um, but also, if, for example, if you do decide that actually, no, I think we're better off without this, don't just say that and nothing else, or even worse, don't just leave it hanging and people, wait, people waiting. Try and formulate a good response and explain your reasoning to say, I'm not 100% sure, you know, we might do this, we might not do this, but I'm, you know, I really don't have a good answer. But, you know, make it clear that, you know, you're not just ignoring people, you haven't just left it hanging. Because that's one of the worst things, if people think they're blocked and they think they're still blocked and they're just waiting on you to respond. Right, yes, so I phrased the question as like, what do I do just like to be controversial? I wasn't expecting anyone to just give me like a four-step procedure, but the, those are useful pieces of advice, thanks. 
So Dan had a, a, a very good point that I think we, we lack both also what um, Bidel was saying. We, we lack ability to like train people, to teach them in a more structured way how to resolve disputes and how, you know, how to interact well with people. Um, and we lack good structures for dealing with things when it gets more difficult. Um, in that context, I want to say, right, I, there's a lot of things I'm proud of. The structure of the technical committee is not one of them. I now regard it as a failure, and I'm sorry for that. I was young and foolish and um, didn't understand many things that I understand much better now. I think we could improve that. There are, it's not easy. We can't just take a corporate model. Uh, Debian is a political enterprise as well as a technical one and people come to it for political, even ideological reasons, and that means that sometimes you have to deal with ideological disagreements, and that's always difficult. Uh, but there are other projects. You could, we could look at political projects as well as, uh, I'm thinking of Occupy, perhaps. Um, there are other people who have faced some of these same challenges and who've done work both well and badly. Um, I'm not sure what the structure would be for how we would do such an investigation, but I think that would be, you know, we should be thinking about how to, how to do this better. Um, and I'm sorry to have, you know, left the project with a problem insofar as it was my fault. So if you think it is wrong, I'm not suggesting we discuss it now, but it's definitely worth having a wider discussion about what you think would be better. We've had lots of those discussions. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but actually, but, but follow through and actually come up with I don't know more more consensus on a better model is of course hard. Uh, yes. Also, um, I am not the person who should be trying to do that. I have a, you know, I mean, I, my my opinions in this area are, um, and my reputation is in some quarters very controversial and. Um, the result is that when I have tried to do what you just suggested, my words were completely misunderstood by many of the people that I wanted to convince. And I think if somebody else had written something very similar, that it would have been interpreted quite differently. Um, and also, you know, I'm very much on one side of the, you know, there's, there, there are some like political questions to be answered there, and I'm very much on one end of that, so that also makes me a bad choice. So um, please, would somebody else uh, with a more central kind of reputation and a more central kind of alignment step forward? Yeah, that's an excellent plea. On the other hand, um, I will sort of throw back in your direction that one of the things that just knocks my socks off about Debian every time I step back and think about it is it's really, really amazing how much incredibly good work has been done by such a large group of people in this project who have for a long time been fundamentally enabled by the foundational documents that Ian Murdoch started with the uh, Debian Manifesto and then the work that we collectively did to create the social contract and the constitution and so forth. And while there are clearly warts and imperfections all over the place, um, and lots of things that, you know, I totally agree we could figure out how to do better going forward. Man, this has been so, for the most part, largely successful, and look what we've accomplished, that I, you know, neither you nor anyone else should feel too bad about sort of how things have gone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Um, Last year, I spoke about some techniques or ways of thinking about arguments, and I made the suggestion that outside help be brought in, and I've had many conversations since then. I no longer think that. Uh, I think that the Debian as a community has such a rich culture that uh, perhaps a better way to go is to get folks who are doing a good job in a position to better able to share how they do that, a little bit more of internal how-tos. And so uh, I facilitated an unrecorded conversation of that sort about successful teams. And I, didn't, I wasn't sure of my own facilitation. Was it going to turn into a flaming, you know, how do we do this? But I think it went well. I think there were some really interesting stories and people got a feel for how to share successes. And so maybe next year we 
continue that kind of pattern of this kind of discussion, you know, how to do it better. Yeah, you remind me of that engineering decision in after the First World War of getting the planes that came back from dogfights and the so people had the idea we should reinforce them where, where they have bullets and somebody else said no we should reinforce them where they don't because they came back so the bullets were not in the in in the critical places and so but, but then we focus on the bullet holes or another thing if you want to deal with bullying in schools yes you go and study the schools where there is bullying but even more importantly you go and study the schools where bullying is not to see what they're doing right and it seems to be aligned to the kind of thing and 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 indeed we are here because a lot of energy is spent in focusing on like oh my god we have so many flame wars and uh, a little bit of energy starts to be spent in how does Russ do it <laughs> but <laughs> Russ is not the only <laughs> like excellent uh, 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 is it working okay uh, Russ is not the only good case we have we actually have a lot and um, and so yeah very good suggestion thank you for it and just following on to that a lot of engineering companies now have a quite big culture of retrospectives where they do come together after a specific incident typically but just perhaps you know at any of every end of every month be like what works so that's sharing success stories which is great and that can be all shared between the team and uh, between teams and things like that but also they, they talk about what didn't work like uh, in, in speaking to like the bullet hole type things um, like what you know what we can do better and things like that and so that's it, that really reminded me when you said um, I know I think X I, sorry, I used to think X, but now I don't think X. That's fascinating. Why? Why did you change your mind? You know, those kind of those kind of conversations are almost more interesting to me and perhaps more useful than what X actually is. Yeah, you see what I mean. I like the idea of retrospectives, and and in a company you have trigger points, like after delivery or something. And in Debian, we could have trigger points for sharing, like after a release, what went well in this release? After mm, some important bug is fixed, after something is announced on Debian developer news, which is cool, uh, starting a thread of how, how did you make that happen? Wh what did you like about that process? That would be really nice. I mean, that needs to be done fairly well. I mean, for example, if you did a naive version for, I make it up, the salsa migration, it could just turn into, ah, oh, this was terrible, this was terrible, right? Instead of it being more of along the lines of, um, what do we do better next time? What, what, what can we learn from this? Where can we go from here? Or even just what went well. And if mm. you say that didn't go well, you're off topic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So actually one of the things that came out of Catherine's session the other day that I think is worth highlighting sort of in a public recording here is this notion that it would be really cool if one of the things we did at future DevComps is have a session where we just invited people to publicly thank somebody for having accomplished something that was important to them in the project in the last year. And uh, if nobody else does, I'll probably try to remember to put something like that in the session because <coughs> I, you know, I. An awful lot of what happens in this project is done by people who only ever hear about things when something goes wrong. And I have to tell you, every time I've ever had an email that says, hey, thanks for uploading that thing and fixing this problem that's been bugging me for the 12 years you haven't been paying attention to the bug. <laughs> <coughs> you know, OK, that's a bad mixed example. But um, it, it, is, it is really nice when you get positive feedback. And I think doing some of that publicly in a session that gets recorded and where everybody gets a chance to see how many cool things have gone on would be really useful for the overall attitude of everybody working on the project. Please, lightning thanks session. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that you have to spend money and haul in a human relationship professional you can get one from internal volunteers, but just make sure they've got a license. So in fact, I'm gonna go back a little bit more and on the thanks thing, you know, the thing that we have done, and you know, okay, Ian is of course going to pick up on the bad things. It is very common for engineers, my wife tells me off of this all the time, to sound negative because we're forever looking on, not necessarily 
broken things. We're not complaining. We're continuing to look by our very nature for how we can improve things. <laughs> you know, continuing to talk about things that could be improved and here's how I'd improve it is not a complaint that, oh my God, this is awful, this, this is rubbish, you know, it should never be done this way. It's a, how can we add the extra 5% of polish on the top that would make this even better? It's a really good thing. So, again, not wishing to give Ian too big a head, you know, but going back and looking at our constitution and looking at a lot of our foundational documents, how many other groups out there have co co borrowed, copied, stolen wholesale from what we've got because they think we're doing it well? Um, you know, we, can, we should be looking at places where we, ha we, we have generated good stuff and share those with each other. Um, if someone's um, got a long layover, um, perhaps they might want to um, check out, I believe it's um, called um, Dealing with Disrespect. It's a P free PDF, etc., from John O. Bacon. Um, it's, I've read it a couple of times. It's got some interesting points. I don't agree with everything, but it's, as I say, if you get uh, stuck in the airport on the way home and we're interested by this conversation, it's worth a read at least to put yourself on and get some of the, the language and stuff like that. Yeah. Perhaps someone can find the link and gobbyize that. Yeah. Cool. So I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Do we have any more comments or are we, are we finished? Ah, Tassia. Yeah, um, I do have a comment that uh, after the, the bit from the PL uh, session, when you brought those numbers, I really thought of it would be nice if we had a dashboard or something that we constantly have those numbers like and it will be more a publicity uh, team task, I think, to collect or at least to receive all those numbers or achievements that we did. Maybe once a month we have this um, portal or something that we can continuously like check out w what we are doing well with these ideas of uh, cheering up uh, the good thing and uh, thank you messages or for important teams or decisions. Cool idea, thanks. Do you want to help make it work? <laughs> <laughs> you know how, that's these, how these things happen. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I was hesitating, but it was a short comment and I'm running away. <laughs> it is interesting though, when we're in the middle of some really intense discussion, um, <clears throat> a couple times I've found it useful to just go take a look at how many package uploads have been made in the last day or the last week or the last month or something. And this is the reason that I had that sort of observation that I made to a reporter a few years ago that um, most of the work in Debian gets done by a silent majority because there are people who just keep working on packages and fixing things and improving them and uploading new versions and all this stuff no matter what's going on in our mailing lists or you know who's yelling at who about what and uh, so yeah I would echo that I think that at least for me um, and okay, I've been around a long time, I actually know where to go to look to get lots of bits of data and who to ask when I don't know. Um, but um, it is immensely positively sort of influencing when you see how much work other people are doing on something that you care a lot about, regardless of how you happen to feel about it that day. And our time is up, so thank you all very much once again for your time and attention. Some really cool questions. I hope this has been useful. And um, I don't know that we'll ever do this exact kind of session again in the future, but um, I'm certainly to the point in the process where uh, at least part of what I think about every time I'm coming back to DevConf is what can I do to help convey some experience and wisdom about things that have happened in the past, what's gone well and what hasn't. Uh, in the hopes of helping this be a project that continue, can continue to go on for a really long time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>